He's currently working on uh, utility sector energy efficiency. He's working on federal and state climate strategies, and he's continuing to work on appliance and efficiency standards. He was recently inducted to the Energy Efficiency Forum Hall of Fame, which recognizes all the things he's done over the years. So let's welcome Steve Nadell. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? This work? Yes, good. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction, and I look forward to chatting with you a little bit and then listening to your questions. So, I'm going to talk about energy efficiency, a little bit about the present, uh, more about the future. Um, just ACEEE, I think Sheldon already described us, so a uh, little bit of information about us. This will be a good opportunity to say all of these slides will be posted on the C website, so I'm not going to be reading every word. Um, as uh, Sheldon uh, described, the uh, U.S. is now much more energy efficient than we used to be. This upper line here shows what energies would have been if we used uh, energy at the same rate per dollar of GDP as we did in the early 70s. Lower line is what we are actually using. The difference is how much we've saved, and this upper line has been adjusted to account for the fact that we import more. We're not trying to take credit for that. So enormous savings. Looking at it another way, energy efficiency is our largest resource ahead of everything else. But there's much more that can be done. Oh, one more uh, thing about uh, past experience. This shows electricity sales in the U.S. Uh, in recent years. As you can see, it, uh, that's the red line. It plummeted during the Great Recession, rebounded. But in recent years, GDP has been growing. Electricity use has been declining. Uh, what are some of the contributors to that? This is a study we did uh, earlier this year. The biggest contributor, the biggest decline, has to do with savings from utility sector energy efficiency programs and appliance and equipment efficiency standards. Second biggest was the uh, fact that uh, winters have generally been warmer, and I say generally, this did not include the last winter. <laughs> um, but it's really making a difference, even statistically, in our electricity sales uh, data. ACEEE, among other things, does an annual state energy efficiency scorecard where we rate each of the state's energy efficiency programs and policies. As you can see here, Minnesota is number 11. So you are clearly above average, but uh, not quite uh, the uh, uh, top here. Garrison Keeler would be proud. <laughs> um, I won't go into all the details here, but here's how Minnesota scored in various areas. As you can see, Minnesota is quite strong in the utility programs. I was ranked number fifth there, uh, but a number of other places, transportation, 24th, uh, building energy codes, uh, uh, 43rd, although you are in the process of uh, adopting some new ones now, so should move up quite a bit. Uh, combined heat and power, I think there's a lot more opportunity there. Uh, um, state initiatives, again, 11th, pretty good. Um, so, shall we say, uh, r opportunities for improvement. Uh, good foundation, but uh, hopefully we can be talking about some additional things to be doing. Um, this just shows uh, more detail, as you can see, in terms of electricity savings, Minnesota is about 10th in the uh, country. That's as a percentage of sales, uh, with uh, Vermont leading the pack. Um, so I think a little bit more opportunity there, although you have a lot of great accomplishments. Um, as uh, Sheldon uh, said, uh, energy efficiency does tend to be the low-cost resource. The green bar there is a result of a study we came and I will move around so I'm not blocking too many people. A uh, study we released earlier uh, this year, that's the average cost of energy efficiency programs to the utility across 19 states, and that's based on actual evaluation uh, results. We compare it to the res uh, study on the range of costs for new uh, power plants uh, coming from uh, Lazard Associates. As uh, Sheldon said, it's roughly about a third of the cost on average. I'd also note that we did this study uh, five years earlier. The cost is essentially the same. People keep saying, oh, well, you start harvesting the efficiency resource, you know, you have to climb higher in the tree, the cost will go up. So far, we have not seen it. The cost has been level across two studies now we've done. Uh, I'd also point out in the case of gas, there are a lot of efficiency opportunities in gas, I think, as all of you know. This is from a study in the Northwest. But as you can see here, there's lots of efficiency resources as long as gas costs about less than uh, 90 cents a therm. So there's still 
a lot of opportunity. The fact that gas prices are down from their peak means a little bit less savings opportunity, but still a lot available. And then we have uh, some new challenges coming up. I think many of you are aware how EPA a few weeks ago released uh, uh, draft rules for existing power plants. That's going to require the owners of those plants to reduce their emissions. They can fuel switch, they can increase renewables, but by far the biggest uh, opportunity, according to the EPA analysis, is they can help promote end-use energy efficiency investments. This particular slide shows uh, likely uh, coal power plant retirements. The light blue are ones that have already been announced. The dark blue are ones that in this particular analysis, uh, they thought are at risk of being closed. I would say as an order of magnitude, the light blue are all being closed, half of the dark blue will be closed. We have to make up that power uh, some other way. And energy efficiency, I think, can be the number one source of replacement power as these plants close. Um, we also just did a study looking at efficiency opportunities in each of the 50 states, given where they are at now, given their current building codes, their current utility programs, et cetera. What are the opportunities uh, to uh, save energy going forward? This is the results from Minnesota. Um, and as you can see, uh, large opportunities, particularly from the utility sector. That's the blue. Uh, the orange is uh, building codes. Uh, the light orange at the top is combined heat and power. So all of these together can really contribute quite a bit. So I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the next big things. And I'm going to mention a number of them. Uh, just say a little bit about them, and I think some of the other speakers will be going into more detail on a few of them. Uh, number one on my list is what I call intelligent efficiency. Uh, things like smart buildings, smart manufacturing, I'll describe it more in, uh, in a minute. But how do you use sensors, controls, uh, um, computer chips to help uh, get information to consumers or to help automatically control so that we reduce energy waste? Uh, just enormous. Uh, strides in uh, things like uh, wireless uh, sensors that make this all possible. Uh, we can improve our uh, homes and appliances, uh, particularly there's a one-two where the utilities offer incentive programs which help make it very feasible then to update the building codes and appliance uh, standards. There's advanced lighting design, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, one big thing, uh, strategic energy management, sometimes calls continuous improvement. Uh, ISO has their, uh, uh, not ISO, yeah, ISO has a 50,001 continuous improvement standard, and we see this uh, becoming much more common in, uh, in large uh, companies, just like uh, the ISO uh, 9000 and 14000 series have uh, become. So uh, intelligent efficiency, these tend to be the types of things that give information to people so they can use the energy more efficiently, or the technology-centered example, uh, things that you get the information and things get automatically controlled. There are also opportunities to basically change the services that uh, we're using and save energy, whether that's uh, telecommuting or uh, you know, e-commerce. But all of these are things that are made possible by information technology. And in a study we did uh, late last year, we see 15, 20 percent savings opportunities coming from these types of uh, uh, measures. Um, building codes, I mentioned uh, a lot of opportunities th uh, there. This particular chart shows your baseline code about where Minnesota is, but then there have been uh, recent updates in the commercial building codes that can be adopted, and eventually we see further code upgrades, maybe eventually getting into uh, uh, zero net energy way out in the future. Um, advanced lighting design I mentioned. I think another speaker will talk about those in a minute, but we have things such as task ambient lighting approaches. You just light the task for the light levels you need and the ambient levels is much reduced. There are things like uh, color adjustable uh, lighting, uh, LED lighting. The human eye can uh, perceive certain colors more, so you may adjust the color by the time of day depending how intensive the task is. Uh, we're doing this in our new office and have reduced the uh, watts per square foot quite a bit. Uh, then there are uh, some of the wireless controls also, but I think we'll be talking, the next speaker will talk about those. Combined heat and power systems, as I mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities there. I know uh, there's been some discussion in the legislature. Maybe next year some progress could be made on how to better promote those. Uh, how do we uh, make the plug loads much more efficient? And I know uh, 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 Senator C is working on that one as well. Um, existing buildings, most of the energy uses in existing buildings, how do we make those more efficient? Industrial process improvements, uh, most 
Industrial programs tend to just be motors and lighting, whereas the big energy savings are on the process improvements, but you have to get your hands dirty. You have to really understand the process. You have to work when the process is being uh, re-engineered, not just any time. Advanced thermostats, whether it's Nest or I guess Honeywell's about to come out with one. I assume there's someone from Honeywell here. Um, high efficiency uh, commercial rooftop units. Uh, and chiller replacement. There's still a lot of old chillers out there that are using CFCs and are very inefficient. As I mentioned, combined heat and power, this picture shows New York City during a Superstorm Sandy. And yes, you can pick in the corner, you can pick out the one building that had a combined heat and power system and didn't have to uh, uh, turn the lights out. Uh, so uh, particularly with uh, lower natural gas prices, uh, they do uh, often uh, make sense. Um, I mentioned uh, plug loads. This is a list from a study we did uh, last year looking at the major saving opportunities from plug loads. How do you, if you replace existing televisions with the best uh, in use, how much you could save televisions. Uh, distribution transformers are the building transformers, not the ones the utilities have, but the ones actually in the buildings, PC, ceiling fans. All these things add up uh, quite a bit, so I think we're going to have to be spending a lot more attention to, uh, looking at these little plug loads. I mentioned building retrofits. The uh, poster child for that is the Empire State Building. They did a major retrofit, saved about 38%, uh, but have managed to do it by reducing the load so they didn't have to replace their chiller, so that was a big uh, savings. Most buildings are not going to go through a major near-gut rehab. I think we're mostly going to have to figure out how to do this in stages. You start figuring out where do you want to go, what do you do first, what do you do second, giving the age of the equipment, giving tenant turnover, et cetera. But how can we develop these long-term plans and then implement them in stages? Um, I think uh, on-bill financing, particularly for residential small commercial, will be very important for uh, helping to do these more comprehensive retrofits. And I know Minnesota's working on a, a new program that's about to start. This is a chart which you can look at later uh, uh, from a study that Lawrence Berkeley National Lab just uh, published a few weeks ago. This chart details the five biggest programs across North America, which have some useful lessons. Um, keep going. Uh, there's lots of opportunities. It's, there's no single silver bullets, lots of silver BBs, so I'm going through a number of these uh, little BBs, if you will, uh, providing actionable information on energy use to consumers, and I mean use that the average consumer can understand and act on, not for the, for the engineer who likes playing around with the uh, charts and graphs, but how do you provide actionable information to consumers? I think it could be real important. How do we do a better job with air and duct sealing? Uh, we played around with this for, I mean, Sheldon and I were talking about it for uh, more than 20 years, but it hasn't become widespread. How do we make it much more widespread? Advanced water heaters, uh, whether it's a heat pump water heater or a condensing gas water heater, a lot of opportunities there. On the utility side of the meter, um, there are opportunities to adjust the voltage uh, on the distribution feeder so you get just enough voltage at the end of the line, but no more than that. Most of the time, there's excess voltage there, so you can typically save maybe 2% of total electricity use. And then there are things like LED lighting. Um, switching gears then, and before I wrap up, uh, one of the things we recently came out with just uh, um, week and a half ago with a study looking at the utility of the future. You've probably all heard about the death spiral and how the utility industry is radically changing and everybody's going to have photovoltaic panels and the utility is the thing of the future. We actually did a study where we looked at, well, what could potentially happen looking at if you did a lot more energy efficiency, you did a lot more photovoltaics, but guess what? You were limited by the amount of roof area that wasn't blocked by trees. Um, and looked at, could there be a death spiral? We also looked at many different studies out there about what should happen to the utilities. And based on that, make some recommendations. In terms of the death spiral, this is the uh, analysis for the uh, Midwest Reliability Organization, which is Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. That was the way the regions were broken out. Uh, the upper blue line is what the Department of Energy's Energy Information Administration projects in a business-as-usual case. Um, the middle line is uh, what if you did a lot more efficiency, what if you did a lot more photovoltaics, what if you did a lot more uh, electric vehicles. Basically, on the first line, sales grow about 0.7% a year. The second line, sales are about level. 
Then we did a third case. What if you let out all the stops, basically put as much photovoltaics in as the roofs will uh, uh, accommodate, really push uh, energy efficiency, um, push electric vehicles. There we got uh, sales to decline about 0.4% a year. So even in the worst possible case, we don't see a death spiral. That said, utilities, as Sheldon said, used to have sales grow 7% a year. If they're going to grow between negative 0.4% and positive 0.7%, that's not exactly the thing that's going to cause stock prices to uh, increase. Um, so what are the utilities going to have to do? Um, oh, this is a little further breakdown on that study. Um, the big opportunity was energy efficiency. Photovoltaics was second. Electric vehicles was much smaller. I'll just leave it at that. So what are the utilities going to do? We think they're going to have to spend more time and attention with optional services, things that people might want to buy where they can make a little extra money. Things like energy efficiency, things like electric vehicle charging, things like uh, CHP, where they have expertise in the engineering and how to operate uh, systems. Uh, things like community scale photovoltaics. They need to use their existing expertise. They don't want to become like Montana Power more than a decade ago, who decided they were going to enter the fiber optic business that they didn't know much about. And, Guess what? They no longer are here. They went Chapter 11. Um, but if they use the existing expertise, we think there's some real opportunities. We think energy efficiency would be an important part of this because it's really, uh, there have been a number of studies showing how the energy efficiency programs are one of the most valued things uh, to the customers. Um, that's one of the major contributors to their satisfaction ratings. So energy efficiency can be used as a gateway to start offering other services because it is so valued. We'd also note you have to be careful about uh, investing too much in new generation and transmission and distribution. If sales are going to be level or declining, you don't need a lot of this. You will need some. You have to replace some critical generation. There are going to be some critical transmission products. We need to harden the local distribution grid so it's more reliable. We'll have to spend more money on how to control the grid, given all the many different diverse generation so resources but we need to prioritize. We can't do it all or else rates will skyrocket. Uh, for example, in Australia, they invested heavily in the grid and managed to double rates there. I don't think we want that to happen in Minnesota or any other state. So just to conclude, uh, Minnesota is close to the leaders, but I think there are opportunities to try harder, like uh, Avis. Uh, the utility industry is changing. We, don't, we see uh, declining uh, growth, maybe even slight negative growth. Um, particularly with the uh, uh, 111D uh, rule coming down. That will mean, I think, uh, a lot more they're going to have to do, particularly in efficiency, uh, but also opportunities for them to promote. Uh, uh, there's also uh, photovoltaics and distributed generation that are cutting into the sales. Efficiency is a critical service to keep power prices in check. If you're going to invest in these other things, efficiency can help reduce the bills uh, uh, so that those rate increases aren't, uh, don't affect people too much. I saw there was a uh, headline today about uh, rate increases here uh, in Minnesota, for example. And then the customers clearly want uh, the efficiency services. I've discussed many potential efficiency measures that whether it's the utilities, the manufacturers, the service providers, or the end users should pursue. Uh, there'll be many more that will come out, and I'm sure some of the other speakers will have other things to suggest as well. So with that, I look forward to hearing the other speakers and also to uh, hearing your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. How many people tweeted Minnesota should be like Avis? <laughs> I think that is highly tweetable. I want, I want you all out there with the hashtags. Um, I want to say... There's a couple folks in the back, and we do have space, so don't be shy. And I know it's probably hard to see some of Steve's numbers in the back, so feel free to move up if you do want to sit here. There's some space. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Jay Stein. Um, we're very excited that we got Jay out here from Colorado. I think we had to promise some cheese curds or a Juicy Lucy <laughs> or something, but we'll, we'll deliver on that, Jay, I promise. 
Um, Jay is with eSource, and I don't know uh, how many of you know sort of the roots of eSource. They actually started with uh, Amory Lovins' group out in Colorado and some of the um, pioneering work that the Rocky Mountain Institute was doing on new technologies in the 70s and 80s and um, wanted to get that out there better sort of into the marketplace and really just do rapid deployment. So they formed um, what you know, what became eSource e at that time for that reason. Um, they spun off as an independent uh, subsidiary in 1992, and they continue from their home base out there in Colorado to s keep track of utility trends and technologies. Um, they play a very vital role in sort of creating collaboration and communication across those of us who run programs. I know they're invaluable to us at CEE. Um, Jay joined eSource in 1996, and he's an executive vice president there. He leads their research department, which investigates a wide range of topics, including program strategies, energy technologies, and retail energy markets. Jay's a specialist in HVAC technology, high-tech industrial process technologies, and the information technology industry. He's currently the project director for the eSource study called Can the Low Temperature Heat Pump Defrost the Status Quo in the Space Heating Sector? <laughs> so I know we are all excited to hear about that one. And uh, he's done some other studies, including uh, work in the semiconductor and related high-tech industries and internet hotels. Um, over Jay's 25-year career in efficiency and renewables, he's designed utility DSM programs, advanced HVAC systems, and also done work on solar thermal collectors. He's authored and co-authored more than 50 technical papers, magazine articles, and book chapters. And before joining eSource, he was a co-founder of eCube Inc., which was an energy consulting firm specializing in building energy analysis and commissioning. So we're very excited to have Jay here. Welcome to the stage. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody, can you hear me? All right. You know, I am so delighted to be here tonight because I've had a long term relationship with the center. About 30 years ago, I came across this paper. Can you guys read the title on this? Yeah? Okay. I don't know how I came across it. You know, there wasn't an internet back then. I must have picked it up one day at a conference, and I loved it. It was a great paper. I, I used it for, oh, for decades to bolster arguments that outdoor reset controls actually do save energy. And so I followed the work of CEE through the 90s when uh, Martha Hewitt did a bunch of stuff on operation and maintenance programs for commercial air conditioning, pro for commercial air conditioning systems, and it, it's just gone on, even till today. In fact, just a few months ago, my organization, eSource, put out a report on combined space heating and water heating systems, where we relied largely on research done by CEE. Now, another thing I love about CEE is the organization's mission, Can, and you guys could read that, right? You don't need me to read that to you. I love I love energy efficiency. And one of the reasons why I love energy efficiency, in fact, the main reason why I love it, is because energy efficiency is one of those few things in this world that's unreservedly good. It's completely good. You can't mess up with energy efficiency. It makes us richer. It improves the environment. It's one of, it's, it's one of the most important engines, our drive, to use energy more effectively has done more to propel our economy forward than just about anything else in the history of mankind. Does that sound like an exaggeration? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. What I think, what I think is the most important technology innovation in human history is actually an energy efficiency innovation. I bet you're wondering, oh, Jay, what do you think? What do you think is the most important technology innovation in human history. Oh, okay. And no, nope, that slide's not there. Well, I'll tell you all about it. <laughs> I'll tell you, the slide disappeared, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you about it. It's the Bolton Watt steam engine. You guys remember the Bolton Watt steam engine? Back in the 60s, the, the 1760s, that is, James Watt was an undistinguished instrument maker at the University of Glasgow. Now back then, 
the main way to convert energy into useful work was to use animals. So, you know, you'd use horses for transportation, you'd use oxen for pulling plows. There's a, you know, at the time there was a, a primitive steam engine around, but it, it was so unwieldy and inefficient, it was only used for pumping water out of mines. And one day, a professor, an engineering professor at the university, brought James Watt a model of one of these primitive steam engines and asked James Watt if he could get it to work, because it, it was broken. And James Watt really thought hard about this. And you know, he never actually did fix that primitive model that primitive steam engine, but he figured out how to make it four times as efficient. And this was a huge insight. Set up a business with a, a partner, Matthew Bolton. They manufactured steam engines based on his principle. Uh, it was the main driver of the Industrial Revolution. One of the, 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 the biggest, it drove some of the biggest changes in human welfare and brought in all kinds of new applications, new technologies. It was just over 120 years after James Watt's insight that Thomas Edison set up the first electric power plant on Pearl Street in New York City. And so I think CEE is following in James Watt's footsteps, helping to drive Minnesota's economy forward by helping to develop and identify new innovative energy efficiency technologies. So let's move on from the Industrial Revolution to the revolution that we are in the midst of right now, the Information Technology Revolution. And the Information Technology Revolution is changing energy service technologies. And, and it's really changing them in fascinating ways. Now, I know that this has been predicted for a long time, and you've probably heard lots of speakers get up and talk about this, but in the last few years, this change has really picked up steam. It's really changing energy services in a way that we really hadn't anticipated before, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. So information technology, by hooking up our energy service systems to the internet, it's going to make them more sensitive, so they're going to have more sensors, they're going to perceive more about how they're operating and the context they're operating in. Because they're on the internet, we can communicate with them, they can communicate with us. They're going to be way smarter because computers and far off distance data centers can do complex calculations we never could before. They're going to be customized, right? They're going to deliver to us the energy services we want and only the energy services we want in the way we want them, when we want them. They're going to be invisible. We're not going to necessarily see big old chunks of technology in our space anymore. They're going to fit more seamlessly in with our built environment. And also, yeah, they're going to be more efficient, not because we did anything to make them more efficient, but because they're smarter, they're more communicative, they're more sensitive, they're going to get the job done using less energy. So let me give you, let me give you a few examples of this. And you might note that actually uh, um, some of you, uh, you might be pleased if your partners improved in some of these ways. Not all these ways. I don't know. You probably don't want your partners necessarily to become more invisible, but sensitive, communicative, smart. So we're going to be having more intimate relationships than we have now with our energy service technologies. And let me contrast this with the way we've been managing our energy services so far. We've been like this guy in this picture, right? So I'll give you an example. Uh, here we are practically 70 years ago, 70 years into the information technology revolution. And last year, when I wanted to see if my air conditioner was working, what did I do? I opened up my door and stuck my head out to see if I could hear the compressor running. Right? Have any of you ever done this? Yeah, I'm seeing a few nodding heads here. Yeah, how stupid is that, huh? So, compare that to what's going on with the Nest thermostat. Now, when I first heard about the Nest thermostat, I thought, all right, let me get this straight. A bunch of Apple executives are going to turn the thermostat into some kind of cool technology that everybody wants. I was, like, skeptical. 
How many people have thermostats here connected to the internet? Don't be shy, raise your hands. Yeah, it's astonishing how many people actually have hooked up their thermostats to the internet. A few years ago, we wouldn't have, nobody in the, in the audience would have raised their hand at all. And what I didn't get, and what I'm, I'm slowly starting to understand, and what I want to convince you of tonight, it's not just the thermostat, it's the cool mobile phone app that goes with it. That mobile phone app that lets us interact with our thermostat, that lets us see how well our air conditioning system is working or not working. And we can look back and see how well it's functioning and how much energy we've saved. So a similar revolution is going on in the commercial building industry. And so up here in this picture, this is a package rooftop unit. How many folks here have actually seen a real life package rooftop unit? Go up. Yeah, yeah, lots of you, right? The, the package rooftop unit is the most popular way to cool commercial building space. More commercial buildings have package rooftop units to cool them than any other cooling technology. And these things, for the most part, they're as dumb as a rock. They've got a fan in them, and that fan runs at full speed all the time the building is occupied, sometimes even when the building's not occupied. And it doesn't matter whether it's on heating, whether it's cooling, ventilation, whether lots of fan speed is needed or not, it just runs full speed. So three young companies, I think it's so fascinating, the big air conditioning manufacturers didn't figure this out. It took three little startup companies to figure out how to come out with packages of controls that they could retrofit to commercial rooftop units to enable the fans to change speed depending on how much, how much airflow was needed. I thought, okay, that's cool. And then the test started coming out showing that just simply doing that was cutting their energy consumption by 50%. I said, wow, now that's something. Huh? Isn't that amazing? You could cut the energy consumption of these things simply by making them smarter. And we're just starting to see that happen now. So these little startup companies, not the big boys, of course, but these little startup companies did something else that's cool. They hooked the controls of these package rooftop units up to the internet. So suddenly building operators could see for the first time, for lots of them, how well their systems were working or not working. And you can see this is what a typical readout display looks like. I won't walk you through all of it, but you could actually see of my package rooftop units, which ones are doing the job, which ones aren't. Uh, these systems are even smart enough that they could diagnose problems. So you could see on the readout display, here we go, here's the health column. And you could see four of them, they're having a problem. They'll even send an email message to the facility operator to let them know, hey, unit one, having a problem, time to get it fixed. I mean, what do these building operators used to do? Well, for one thing, the package rooftop units would just go on malfunctioning almost indefinitely. CE's work in the 90s showed that. Or if they finally did figure out that something was, wasn't working right, they'd have to call a contractor. The contractor was going to come out and charge them whether he found something wrong or not. So for the building operators, this is a huge advance. The ability to see what's actually going on with their systems and the ability to maintain them way more effectively for less money than they used to be able to. Now, once you got packaged rooftop units with fan speeds that ramp up and down, you could solve another big problem in buildings. And this is one of, this is one of the biggest problems that I think I've ever seen in buildings. So building designers, when they're designing HVAC systems, they're, heating, they're designing air conditioning systems, they lump together different parts of the building into zones, right? Because you can't have a separate unit for every individual room. You've got to have zones. But in order to save money, they lump together a bunch of different parts of the building that don't really belong together into zones. And as a result, you've got some parts of the building that are really hot, and some parts of the building that are really cold, right? How many people have seen, have been in buildings where this was a problem? Yeah, the, the three of you who didn't raise your hands, I think you're lying. Yeah, <laughs> right? Every building I've seen has this problem. Well, this little company 
named 75F has figured out a solution to this problem. And what they've done is, and I'm going to just kind of walk you through this. So here's the package rooftop unit over here. Here's the trunk duct. Here's all the branches. And you can see the branches have, uh, have balancing valves in them. So what we've typically done is when we think this is a problem, we'll call out the balancing guys or the, the air conditioning guys. And they'll monkey around with the balancing valves. And people say, yeah, it's kind of, it's a little bit better now. It's okay. And then... When the seasons change, all that balancing work goes right out the window, and we're back to all kinds of discomfort again. And after a while, people just stop calling out the balancing adjuster guys because it's way too expensive, and they don't really, it doesn't really last. So the way this system works is every one of these branches has got a motorized balancing valve, not a manual one. It's got its own thermostat, and the thermostat's attached to, is hooked up to the motorized balancing valve. And the thermostat is also hooked up to the internet. And the thermostat sends the data over the internet in some computer in some far off data center figures out at that moment based on, because it knows what the weather is and it's watched the building, so it's learned how the building operates, and it figures out what's the optimum adjustment for that damper at that moment. And voila, hey, Problem solved. Suddenly, everybody in the office building can have pretty much whatever space temperature they want. Or they could have completely even temperatures, if that's what they want. And they save energy to boot. I just think that is so cool. I, I just think that's really awesome. And because it's on the internet, you can then see how's everybody getting along? How are all the different temperatures doing? Hey, this guy's having a problem here. Okay, so we got... A current temperature is 69 and a half. We've got a temperature setting at 82 degrees. Something's going on here. I'm going to, okay, I'm going to call the uh, service guy when I'm done. So, anyway, great innovation. Hey, let's play a game. You guys want to play a game? All right. Find the air conditioner in this picture. Somewhere in this picture, there's an air conditioner. Where is it? Not... Oh, come on. Somebody must have a guess. The wind, no, it's not the windows being open. This isn't the Soviet Union, but that was a good guess. <laughs> what, what's that? The floor? No, it's not the floor. That's a good one. No, I love radiant cooling. Yeah, the pig, who said that? Everybody give this guy a hand. Whoa, I mean, he's on top of it. Yeah. Yeah, the picture on the wall is an air conditioner. And what it is, and I'll tell you what's going on here. This, it's part of a ductless air conditioner. And we know that ductless air conditioners are more efficient than centralized systems with ductwork because they, they get rid of all the leaky ductwork and they've got variable flow fans and variable speed compressors and they give people lots more flexibility for setting temperatures. Problem is, is people like those big old chunky indoor consoles on the ductless air conditioners. And so LG Electronics has figured out the solution to that problem. We can get people the more efficient air conditioners, and we can get them to them without those ugly indoor consoles. They got an indoor console that most of you didn't even realize was part of an air conditioner. So here we are, an example of our energy systems be becoming more invisible. And the same revolution I've been talking about with heating and air conditioning, it's going on in lighting. There's a little company in my hometown of Boulder, Colorado, that's putting uh, communication chips into the ballast for fluorescent lamps and the drivers for LED lamps. So you at your desk, in your cubicle, you can adjust the brightness of that light above you so you don't have to sit there under light that's too bright or too dim. You now suddenly have the power to adjust it. Uh, Philips has come out with a similar product for homes. That's what this picture is of. Uh, you can adjust the color of any, any lamp in your house. You can adjust how bright it is. Feature I like is you can check to see if the kids left the basement light on before you go to bed at night. Isn't that, isn't that an awesome feature? And so, similarly, uh, lighting systems, our lighting systems are going to become more invisible as well. But due to the magic of organic light emitting diodes, LA OLED fixtures. So OLEDs are just like conventional LEDs, 
only because they're organic, you make them by spraying or depositing thin layers onto glass. And so you can make lighting fixtures in pretty much any shape, any size you can imagine. Um, you can even have curved fixtures. So you want light on a particular surface, you want a room to be light, well, you just, just, put, in, um, just put in a ceiling panel that lights up. You want a particular, you can see here, um, you want a particular spot on the wall to be bright. Just put in a wall panel. Um, put in whatever spot, what, wherever you want light, you can just add a building structure that emits it. And of course, these can all be hooked up to the internet as well and have all those cool features I just told you about a moment ago. And so, that's why I am really excited about our energy future. I'm really thrilled about the work CEE has done all these years to help advance it. And I'm looking forward to following CEE's research in the years to come as the center figures out um, how to advance the, t the kinds of technology as I talked to you about tonight and helps figure out how to help them save even more energy and get them into more people's hands. Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be here.